our next speaker uh, is Janine Powell, and she is our uh, expert on uh, meaningful use. And uh, she, she's going to have some exciting news to announce uh, for you in a few minutes. And she's also in charge of our implementation. So you, she's a two-in-one package, all-encompassing. Um, and uh, Janine, with that, welcome, Janine. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, today we'd like to talk about meaningful use requirements and how to get to attestation as quickly as possible. Um, we've had a lot of experience with that here at MedSphere, and so uh, we'd like to uh, go over the requirements and uh, see how you can get to that quickly and get your funds quickly as well, as well as do uh, something meaningful with the EHR. So there's two parts to um, meaningful use. Of course, there's that you have to be on what's called certified EHR technology. That is up to your software company to get that certification. Those requirements come from the ONC, and there is a, a vigorous testing process that the software goes through to become a certified product. Um, and then there's the part that uh, comes for the hospitals to prove that they are actually using that certified EHR in a meaningful way. Um, and the meaningful use is really to confirm your clinical results, to make sure that you are improving your efficiency, the quality, and patient safety. Um, but you can deploy the same software in two or three different places and get completely different outcomes. It's really the leadership and, what, and the services and the uh, processes that you put in place around meaningful use requirements that get you uh, to those uh, criteria and thresholds that you need to meet. What it takes really is for the hospital to rally. They need to have uh, full support of their executive team. So there's governance, there's change management that occurs within uh, the meaningful use process. And um, it's basically 20% technology, it's really 80% processes and best practices. I like this slide because this is a certified pumpkin from the FDA, but that doesn't get you to meaningful use. So you use best practices just like you use a recipe to get it from one thing to the next and uh, a lot better, I think, tasting in the end. So what does it take? We partner with our clients and we really uh, recommend uh, that we start at the top, we have the leadership buy-in that they are fully going to support the hospital's uh, work and processes that go into uh, a change process and uh, to get everyone on board, all the clinicians, to use the EHR in a meaningful way. Uh, the second thing is really to establish uh, an EHR meaningful use committee at your hospital. Um, then there are some prioritizations that you need to do in terms of uh, which stage one requirements you are going to fulfill um, that are based on a menu selection. And then there's lots of planning, planning, there's lots of training, and then there's constant checking. So to establish um, a EHR meaningful use team, uh, it's best if you have a clinical leader that's leading the team that is responsible for pulling all the people together because this is usually um, a weekly meeting when you're really heads down in, in trying to achieve these uh, thresholds. We definitely need physician champions. Um, there are as many of the things that are required uh, to meet meaningful use have everything to do with what, how your physicians are using your EHR. It is very, very important to have quality involved. They're very familiar with a lot of these measures already, and they can be very helpful in, in translating from how you might have met these requirements in the paper world to how, where, and how we can uh, efficiently uh, meet those requirements in an electronic world. Um, your clinical systems analysts, your builders of, of the clinical system is involved as well as you need your training lead because there will be new things to be training on so that everyone is rowing in the same direction. 
And occasionally you will need some of the other uh, uh, ancillary or professional services to participate in some of the thresholds. IT lead is important as well as having a very strong executive sponsor. Um, so when you're uh, getting ready to report and, and look at these standards, um, it's important to note that you are reporting on all patients, even though these come from um, the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, they actually are, you're required to report on all patients. The first uh, year is a 90-day continuous period of attestation, meaning that you're looking at that data for a continuous 90-day period. And really when you look at it, it's 34 separate measures. I know we say there's 14 that are required and there's five from a menu of 10, but the one, the one measure that has everything to do with the quality measures really expands into 15 core measures. So um, while that looks like it's one item, it's really 15 and, the, and that's where a lot of the work comes in. So how does MedSphere help you with meaningful use? We've actually taken each criteria and we created content that helps you meet the criteria within OpenVista. So these tools exist in the product already. We've actually though decided to deliver the content this time to you, the templates, the order sets, the um, reminders that go along with helping you achieve meaningful use. Um, we package these in a rollout program, so they're called system design blocks, and there's one for each criteria. We have um, a clinical consultant and a project manager that work with you on an ongoing basis uh, to go through each one of these criteria, make sure that you do all the planning and decisions around those. The design blocks takes you through each, each decision point that you need to make regarding those criteria, and then we help you uh, do the planning on how you're going to train and roll that out. And you don't necessarily, if, if you are already live with the software, you don't necessarily wait till you've got all of them done to roll them out. You can, uh, this can be an ongoing basis that you roll them out as you get them done. Um, then we uh, actually, we do a lot of assessment and training. Um, there's a lot of education that it needs to be done throughout your organization about what is meaningful use, what are the criteria, what do they mean, and how do we do it within the system. And when uh, MedSphere does a lot of that with you, we teach you how to do it in your own organization. We give you presentations that you can then redo um, at your will. This is an example of one of the clinical design blocks. So each design block has an introduction to it. What are we, what are we working on uh, in this particular area? What are the objectives? Who are the participants that need to be involved in this particular meeting? And then there's an education portion to it that shows you how in the system uh, you can achieve that criteria. And then decision points, questions at the end with you being able to write down your decision points so everyone remembers what we said the last meeting and uh, continuing from there. So these are the 14 uh, required meaningful use for stage one. You're probably uh, fairly familiar with these. Um, there's uh, computerized order entry for medications, uh, drug, drug, drug allergy interactions, uh, your demographics in a structured way that you can report on them. There needs to be a current and active problem list, current and active medication and allergy list, and then there's vital signs, smoking history, the decision support, um, the 15 quality measures that we said exploded out, and then there are electronic versions of um, the healthcare information if a patient requests it or if they request their discharge instructions to be electronic. So these are the kind of processes that we go through with you to say, you know, what happens on the floor if someone requests their electronic record? What do we do? Does the nurse put in a consult? Does it go down to medical records? What kind of other forms need to be signed before we release, release this information? You were talking about security, so what kind of um, secure media are you gonna put this electronic record on to give to the patient? And it has to be done in three days. So there's timestamps involved in all of this to get um, the credit as well. Um, Similarly, then there is testing of the electronic uh, record being able to be exchanged. So through the continuum of care document or record, it's exchanging and doing a test with another facility or a public health agency that can accept an electronic format. 
So we have that um, capability within Open Vista, and then we help you coordinate. We actually, for our customers, we had three of them coordinate and trade information between each other uh, to, to prove that they could um, actually do the electronic healthcare exchange of information. The last one has to do with protecting security and privacy, and that is really up to the uh, healthcare facility to conduct that risk um, assessment themselves. So you may have done a HIPAA risk assessment, uh, assessment before, and then this is actually then taking that, making sure you update it, and also that you include now, if you're using an electronic medical record, how do those play into your policies and procedures um, in order to protect and secure the record? talked about these things, working on them, you know, throughout uh, the different weeks if you're already live with the software. If you're not live with the software, we roll this into your implementation process so that literally when you go live, um, you can meet the thresholds for CPOE, for active problem lists, for allergy lists, medications. These are all things that are easily attainable day one, literally, um, it, with the right planning and buy-in. This is where your physician steering committee comes in. It is very, very important that you get their buy-in and they understand uh, what their uh, part in, in it is and why and, and uh, spread the news and have evangelists um, regarding using the electronic record. Um, and the executive sponsors having uh, really an, an, a, hus a hospital-wide expectation uh, set from the very beginning. Other things that you can go live with and attest to positively uh, day one are inherent within the system as part of the implementation process. Drug, drug, drug allergies are part of the database that we deliver to you. And then there are also um, therapeutic substitutions that we can set up for you in your drug formulary as part of the implementation to meet one of the menu criterias. Um, Similarly, with your demographics, you could be at 100% at go live. This has everything to do with setting required fields in your uh, registration process. Open Vista receives those and stores them in their structured data to be able to be reported. So one, the very first um, example of one of the criteria is that 30% of your medication orders have to be done using CPOE. And it's really just that one uh, you have to look at your unique patients in that 90-day period, and they have to have one medication order at least on their record that has been placed by a physician. We give you a report that looks, you know, over time and can tell you your numerator and denominators. This is a, a reporting period from July 3rd to uh, 9.30, which is a 90-day attestation period that just occurred, and this particular hospital was at 90% of their patients met this. So way over the criteria. The, the threshold is 30, and um, they're at 90. So doing very, very well, and very well positioned now uh, for actually stage two, because the thinking for stage two is that the, the thresholds are going to increase. So they're way on their way already to be able to meet those as well. But if they're not, if you, if you run the report and, and let's say they're not at that threshold and we give you the tools to actually analyze who and why it's not and where it's not happening. So this would be a report by provider. It would tell them all the drugs for the patients that they had within that period. And then on the far um, right hand side, it's telling them whether it was placed with a Y. Yes, they placed it themselves or no, they didn't place it themselves. So this gives you some analytic tools to see, is it a particular physician that never places his own orders? Is it a particular med that's really hard to um, uh, order and we need to fix maybe a change up how, how the order looks to um, and do some optimization of that ordering process for that particular drug? Or maybe it's just education. They need to be re-educated re or get some um, really one-on-one -on -one support to make sure that they understand how to do the process. This is an example of drug screening that happens within Open Vista. Again, you're just doing an attestation, yes or no. Do you have this turned on in the product? And you're able to say that very easily. And we think it really is all about physician adoption um, because 
again, you can have the automation, but without the adoption, you don't really get the clinical transformation, and clinical transformation is really what meaningful use is all about. So it, you can't stress enough to get your physicians involved um, from the very beginning. Because one of the hardest um, criteria to meet is really the current problem list. In the inpatient setting, this is just not intuitive or not something that physicians, um, I guess, uh, did on a regular basis was to keep an updated problem list. Usually this is in a HMP, it's, it's free text or it's dictation or somewhere in the record that someone really has to go and look up and read um, and, and find out what are the problems of the patients. This is actually asking you to do it as a uh, discrete data field. They're based on ICD-9 codes soon in the future to be based on ICT-10 codes, and they're available to all the clinicians so that they can see what's wrong with the patient from the very beginning. And if the patient comes back, there's a historical record of, of what happened to them the last time and what were their problems that time. Um, so we also added to the software, um, you can also use a structured data field called No Active Problems. Uh, this comes in very handy for people who are do using this in an outpatient setting that maybe they're coming in for well checks, or it also happens for um, a lot of the newborns that really don't have any, any uh, problems. Uh, we also uh, gave you functionality that is a problem list reviews, reviewed functionality, meaning you've looked at it as the, as the physician, you've looked at the problems, and there are no changes, but you get credit for having reviewed the list. Uh, so this is, again, one of the um, hospitals that was doing attestation. They're at 86 percent. But what we also give you is, again, tools to monitor if it's not working. So this is uh, saying by provider, again, which patients don't happen to have a problem, an active problem on their problem list. And one of the things we found in doing so is, again, that, that newborns weren't considered to have problems, they didn't ever have a problem list. So, the, so we made an easy pick list for um, uh, the physicians who are taking care of the children or delivery at delivery, and they can now use an, a newborn code very easily, or they can chart no active problems, and either way they get the credit. But this wasn't an area, OB's kind of similar when we ran reports, is it didn't come to light that that these would be patients that wouldn't have a problem list. You know, they, didn't, they weren't considered to have, you know, having a baby was a problem, right? And usually, hopefully, it's not. Uh, record vital signs. So you need to have height, weight, and blood pressure uh, recorded for all patients above the age of two. What we found with this one is that um, most hospitals and, and patient care includes height, weight, and, and blood pressure quite easily. But with the pediatric population, that was a little bit different. Many of our caregivers who were taking care of young children didn't normally or routinely require a blood pressure to be taken for children who are, you know, as young as two. So that was just, again, something we talked about. When you run the reports, you see those kinds of things. And then as an education training process for the people who are taking care of the pediatric patients. This is just a, a the screen from Open Vista to show that all of these things that are considered meaningful use are right on the cover sheet for the patient right when you look at the patient and bring them up for the first time. So you can readily see, do they have an active problem list? Do they have a medication list? The allergies are here. We use reminders. Reminders are things that help you um, make sure that you're doing uh, certain things at certain times, either based on problems or uh, age of the patient or things of, uh, that have to do with meaningful use. Um, and also vital signs. So at a glance, you can tell whether you're, how well you're doing on a lot of the meaningful use criteria just by opening patient's chart. And I will tell you, this would be very helpful, have been very helpful. Um, an example, you know, you've given examples of people who have had health care or, or your family members in, in hospitals. I recently had a mother-in-law who was in a hospital in Atlanta, and I went to, I happened to be in the area, I went to see her and asked the nurse, it was about noon when I was there, and asked her, well, okay, so what's wrong with her? Why, why is she here? What are, we, what are you treating for her? I mean, I knew she had a history of, of cardiac problems. And the nurse said to me, I don't know. I don't know why she's here. I haven't had time to read the notes yet. But if she had had the problem list, you know, she could have not had to go read all through, you know, a million notes. She would have known right away, these are the active problems. This is why she's here. This is what we're treating her for. 
So it can be very helpful to pull in this very vital information quickly for caregivers to see in a snapshot what's going on with the patient. Uh, again, this is just a summary report for someone who's doing attestation. They happen to be at 95%. This is um, for vital signs. It's usually one that's very, very high and easier to uh, meet again day one. But again, if, if, there's, if there's a question and you're not meeting the thresholds, we give you three other reports to look at things. We give you who doesn't have the vital signs done at all, who's missing one of the vital signs, like maybe they have the height and the weight but not the blood pressure. And then um, also we give you the report in case you're audited that shows every patient in that 90-day period who did have their vital signs done. So you're, you're covered uh, for any of those kind of audits that come up as well. So meaningful use is really all about planning and learning and um, uh, us being able to train you during the implementation process. Uh, we use something, as I mentioned, called clinical reminders, and there are fulfillment documentation that go with these that then remove those reminders from the front cover sheet. So if your patient comes in and you haven't documented um, the status of their advanced directive, there's a reminder on the front cover sheet that says it's due, you haven't done it yet. As soon as you document it, there's discrete data elements that are captured for that, and it removes that reminder automatically from the front cover sheet. So we use these for meaningful use, but they really can be used for all of your uh, quality measures or anything that you're really trying to get patients to do. I know we have another hospital that is, we're working with right now that is using these for pressure ulcers to make sure that they're followed and everyone is aware that this patient has a pressure ulcer and we're doing some uh, specific treatments for this patient. Um, you really need to assess the workflow. Um, of, again, of, of how was this information being captured before on paper or in what, what step in the process of the patient going through your system was this information captured and where is the most uh, logical place for it to be in an electronic record in, in for those uh, caregivers. We really try to give you multiple options to capture the data, so not just one way. So you can either comp accomplish it through a documentation process or we have a checkbox process uh, for CPT codes if, if that's the way you want to do it. Um, uh, sometimes there are order sets or um, other documentation that count to help you. So if we try to capture it as many places as we can to give you positive credit for the meaningful use. Um, and then we really uh, assist with plans um, for getting the electronic health uh, record for the patient, you know, like I said, how are you, how, what is the process for that, how are you going to do it, and on what kind of media. This is an example of some of the content that we roll out. So this is a documentation template. This is for the smoking status, recording of that. And what it's doing is once you pick one of the uh, checkboxes below, it's recording in a discrete data field in the exact way that um, uh, CMS wants you to be able to report on that out. Uh, clinical decision support rules. There are very, there are many to choose from within Open Vista, and we create new ones all the time. Uh, you'll be very e uh, easily be able to um, invoke one of the cl clinical dis decision support rules. And also, we have clinical support rules during ordering. So there's lots of order checks and order uh, processes that you can have when doing the ordering process. This one happens to say that there was no creatinine done within 30 days for this patient when you're ordering uh, this particular test. Um, also, they don't have an allergy assessment. So it's just warning you that you're ordering something that could have contraindications um, at the real-time process. The quality measures um, are broken down into the 15 uh, core measures. There are two for the emergency throughput measures. There are seven stroke core measures and there are six VTE measures. And you must report on all the numerators and denominators for these uh, measures. But there are, the good thing about these to start with are there are no minimum thresholds. So you can actually even report zero um, and still get credit. Uh, these are harder to catch the data because I think you're doing a lot of the processes in your hospitals, but getting them to chart them in, an, in, an, in a discrete fashion is where we really work with you hard to make sure that you're meeting those criteria. 
These are the VTE ones, just an example. These are the six for the VTE. The one that really stands out is the first one, which is that all patients need to have VTE prophylaxis within the first 24 hours of arrival. Um, this is a little bit new. People have told me, well, we do an, a VTE assessment, and then we assess whether they need VTE prophylaxis or not. But that's not what the measure says. They've kicked it up a notch. They're basically saying, if you're over the age of 18, you need to have some VTE prophylaxis. So we go through that process to help you learn how are you going to do that. The easiest way is to make it a policy order within your hospital that all patients get head hose or, or whatever your choice is for VTE prophylaxis unless the doctor actually orders something different. We put it in every one of your uh, admission order sets so that, that it's readily ordered for the patients um, and things of that nature to make it um, very intuitive and very easy to meet the criteria. This is the menu items. There are 10 menu items and you have to pick five in order to meet meaningful use. And one of the five actually needs to be a interface that goes outbound to your public health agency. So you can either pick lab reporting to public agencies. These are lab tests that you're reporting now um, that are required if you have a certain result on a certain a uh, lab test, they have to be reported to public health. So your lab department is already doing this, probably faxing or doing it on paper somehow. And this is turning it into an automated process so that the 45 uh, lab results that they need to report out to the state get done through an interface. Um, formulary checks, as I said, are, are enabled from day one. Advanced directives, we work with you to have reminders on all of your patients, again, that if they don't have one done, it shows you right on the front cover sheet this needs to be done. And you can rep run a report as management to see um, where these are due. Like, uh, it gives you a report on all patients that have advanced directives due. Lists by patients um, with different conditions. By using the problem list, this really makes it easy for us to pull um, problems, uh, patients with certain conditions because it's done by ICD-9 code underneath. And that's uh, a lot of why all this data is structured and coded underneath. Um, day one, your lab tests are structured. That's all we have in Open Vista, so you're, easy, you're very easily able to attest positively to that and you'll be way over 40% um, threshold. This is just showing uh, an example of a drug formulary check. So if the doctor happened to uh, order enelopril and that is not what you, you, sub, you have a therapeutic substitution of lisinopril, it's gonna come up right away for the doctor to pick the one that you have in your formulary. This is an example of advanced directives. Um, there's a fulfillment uh, template for advanced directives. And it's really not saying does the patient have an advanced, it's saying do they or do they not have one, not that you have to record it electronically. You, just that you have asked the question and given them the information if they haven't had one. So we have a lot of our customers in this attestation period uh, for the first 90 days that just ended um, uh, September 30th. We have Kern Medical Center, Hoboken uh, University Medical Center, and Midland Memorial. Um, the good news, and it was before I, m I made these slides on Monday, and we found out um, very nicely on Tuesday that Hoboken University Medical Center has actually received now their Medicare funds. So they've actually received almost $2 million um, for uh, Medicare funding. So I know there's people here from Hoboken. Good job. So that's what Medsphere does. We actually partner with you. We're at risk with you for these. So if you make it, we make it. So uh, there's a very good synergy and a lot of work that goes on uh, between our hospitals and ourselves to make sure that you get there. Midland Memorial is also one that received funding from Medicaid and that is because their state actually is accepting registration. All of the other, um, the other ones are from California and uh, from New York and uh, New Jersey, and those states have not yet let them even apply for those funds yet. So they can, I think we're all out of money, right? So I think they're waiting till the very last day, which is probably in December of this year, so that then they'll also be able to receive the Medicaid funds. <clears throat> 
people who are starting their attestation period uh, very soon, I think Lutheran said they were going to start in January. Um, for Medicaid, it would be, um, for Kern, it would, all of the other ones would be December, and there's many other ones that are starting their attestation period with us now. And so we're very encouraged. Um, and uh, the rapid piece of this that you need to understand is that Kern Medical Center went live in May, and they've already completed now their 90-day their attestation period. So literally within five months, they were at meaningful use and are able to attest. Similarly with Hoboken, they went live six months ago, and so already they're at attestation. So this is proof that if you are working with the client and, and making it part of the implementation process and looking at it, um, you can achieve what you want to in a very short time. These are actually results. So the first column is Kern Medical Center, then Hoboken, Midland, Lutheran. These were, the first two had their whole 90-day attestation period, but if you look across, it tells you what the threshold is, and it tells you what their 90-day period actually um, was. And as I was saying, a lot of them are way, way above the threshold, so they're going to be very well positioned to meet the thresholds for phase two when they go up, and then instead of having to work on getting their thresholds up, they can work on whatever new requirements come uh, from phase two that they have to work on that they're not doing today. And again, MedSphere is going to partner with them to get them to phase two, and phase three, we're gonna take you all the way through. Um, the next slides are just more results. Again, uh, very, very, very good. Uh, results way above the thresholds in every case. What's interesting about this slide is is we haven't had a lot of you know patients ask for electronic <laughs> records, so um, in some cases no one asked for electronic records. In the cases of uh, some of the other ones, we actually had they actually had patient they encouraged the patient to ask for the record just so they could try the process out so they wouldn't forget how to do it. So, um, you know, that was part of it. But I think as uh, consumer knowledge increases, obviously they're gonna know that they can do this, so you need to be prepared and make sure that you can uh, give that to them. Those two uh, are examples of measures that you can be exempt from if no one, if no one asks for it. You can, uh, in the attestation process, you can say you're exempt. Again, these are more, uh, these are from the menu items. Everyone basically picked to do the uh, public health lab results out, although we do, we're working with a couple of people now that want to do the immunization registries. Uh, that's an interface that would automate that process to the state registries. So how do the incentives go? The Medicare incentives are from 2011 to 2015. Medicaid is from 2011 to 2021. Um, you can get the Medicaid money if your state is uh, participating in it. Um, Medicare will start imposing uh, penalties in 2012, excuse me, 2015. And the good news about Medicaid is you can apply for those meaningful use dollars by just adopting, implementing, or up grading to certified EHR technology. So you really don't have to meet the thresholds to apply for your state funds. You just have to register at the national level. Um, and so there's no, there's no real downside for you to go ahead and start collecting uh, your Medicaid money to help fund uh, either, either the EHR or other things that you want to be doing within your hospital. And there's no penalty if you don't make it. So let's say you, you're implementing the first year and for some reason you don't make your first 90-day attestation, you can do it. There's no downside. You don't get penalized on the Medicaid side. So that's what's different about that. So this is just an example to show you um, where this is going. These are um, the payouts it, by adoption year. So as long as your first 90-day uh, period is within 2013, you will be able to get 40% um, of your money that year. If you wait till 2014, you are going to miss this 40% marker here. And so you're really going to be um, getting less funding if you wait too long. So I can't 
can't encourage you enough to get started. Um, this is where the time crunch changes. And this is really showing you the amount of funding that you might lose. So if you were doing your attestation period within 2013, you may, get, you know, this is an example of a hospital that's based on a lot of calculations, but they would change from actually getting uh, 7.2 million to 4.3 million. So you're losing about, you know, almost $3 million there. This is um, the registration that you are doing online with CMS when you're ready to do attestation and um, all of the numerator and denominators that I, that I um, were talking about are able to be derived from OpenVista. You run the report and then you're gonna fill this in. We've helped lots of clients fill this in or check their numbers or so they feel really good about uh, doing their attestation. And, and you can get started in the beginning for registration by making sure that you have these certain numbers that you need to have, CMS numbers, national provider IDs, legal business name, your tax ID numbers, because those are required when you first do the registration. Then you're ready to go later on when you do the attestation. You must do this registration piece to, to actually do the registration in, at your state level as well. And you need your EHR certified um, <clears throat> number for registration. So for your software, you can look this up and you can get your uh, EHR certification number for, as part of that registration process. So that's the end. Um, we look forward to uh, possibly working with you in the future and we've had really great success with all our clients and, um, and look forward to bringing more people to Meaningful Use. Thank you.